Hello, I'm Howard Park. And I'm Lisa Maselli. And we're here doing a uh, painting of a place we've painted many times, plein air. We're doing studio work. South Beach, Fisher's Island. Correct. So how do you feel about your sky, Lisa? I feel that the sky worked really well. I first put in some raw sienna, light wash, and then went over it with my cools, my blues, some cerulean and ultramarine, and left negative space for the clouds. So you How about your sky, your, your block in, Howard? I can see that you're moving forward with that, with your rocks and your Right, you had, you had done a value sketch on a sketchbook mm -hmm. uh, multiple times, but even for this painting you did. And uh, I still have to do my value uh, study right on, the, right on my uh, finished uh, canvas. So I just prepare that in that way. But the sky is really the, the important part of your painting. That's what establishes the light throughout the painting. Exactly, exactly. And, and I can see yours has more light coming in from the left side. And that's going to be your source of light. And I left a lot of light at my horizon. You can see where the that warm wash comes through the through the painting. So what happens is when you've laid in your sky like that, now you're ready to use the rest of your your colors and your values uh, to compare to the finished sky. Exactly, the sky is the lightest part of the painting, and it really establishes the emotional tone of your painting. And so it's really important to in a painting like this to capture what you felt when you were out there, either painting plein air, or what you're seeing in the in this case. We're working from plein air paintings or photos and our memory of the scene. Correct. So in my sky, I've compressed the sky by keeping on the light side warm and light to the left and coming in with these slightly darker blues to the right. And it takes me a lot longer to get my sky in. You can see how much more rapidly you've advanced and you've done this wonderful work with that water. My goodness, how that really makes the depth at the horizon line and gives you that sense of the plane of the water. Right. And I'm using a one and a half inch flat brush, which is wonderful for just getting those large marks in so that you don't over fiddle the water, which in watercolor is key. You want to let some of the white come through for some little wavelets and what have you and, you know, not worry too much about the details and warm it up as, as I'm coming to the front here. The same thing would apply with, uh, with oil painting, and in this case using a knife, you use the largest knife you're comfortable with, right? That, mm -hmm. would, that allows you to, to not fiddle for the details. You wait till the very end of the painting. That's when you can mess up your painting. Wait right. till the very end. Don't do it at the beginning. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and I think our, our, the key when we're working plein air or in the studio is we try to keep these paintings fresh. And so by using this large brush, I've moved to a smaller brush to do some of the rocks now. Um, so I can get those angles and, and just the simplicity of those rocks. And again, that's a square brush so that you can mm -hmm. get those, the facets, right. the multi-facets of the rocks. Now, how do you do your rocks, Howard? How do you well, I think find about those? I still work them the same way, and I, and I uh, do use a, a fairly uh, large blade when I, when I first start out. Right now, I'm, I'm bringing the water down, which is going to help me uh, eliminate some of the undertone of the painting, which is a slightly gray uh, uh, tone. Uh, that will allow me to find the right values on those rocks in relation to the sky and the water. There's a bit of undertone there with that, with that uh, slightly purple color that would be reflected right. from what's behind me. So when I get to the rocks, I still will stay with as large a knife as I can and do what you do when you pick up multiple colors on your flat brush. That one mm -hmm. and a half brush, I've seen you pick up different colors on each corner of it and with one mark make a, a wonderful value uh, and, a, and a colorful as you did just now. Right, right. And, you know, I see that you have on your block in, you've got a lot of rocks on your beach. How are you going to simplify those as you go in? Well, in the end, I end up just covering up a lot of those, try uh -huh. to make one swipe through them. Uh, even if I had, had already laid paint down, painting in gobs, painting in blocks, letting that color down, heavy application of paint, I, I'll pull my knife through it. Right. Your simpl simplification of the beach was well thought out, reads so well, and it, and it really leads you in up to your, up to your right. uh, figures in the background. 
Right, and I see what we're both doing is we're, with this large foreground rock, we really have some warms in there and some warms in that entry area, so that brings the viewer in. You want to warm up things as they come forward in the picture plane. That's cool. And I can see that you're, you've got some nice warms right on the that face of that rock and warm sand on your beach. Right, a little reflection in the rock, a little bit of sky color, not to make that too much contrast between the lights and the darks. That, that can be most difficult to, especially for you to correct as a watercolorist. Right. Right, it's, it's much harder for me to go back in and make a lot of corrections, so I really do have to think it out, and that is part of what I do in the value sketch, is try to get my darks and lights worked right. out before I actually start painting. Absolutely. So I'm going light to dark, you're going dark to light. Which, which is really the, the easiest way to do an oil painting. Uh, that uh, dark to light is uh, more easily uh, correctable and easier to see the value changes. Um, you, uh, I think, have to really be a lot more intellectual about your paint application and how you mm. approach your painting. Mm. And, and you can see what I'm doing now is getting some of those real warm colors in the foreground that really push back the cooler colors in the background and get that sense of that, you know, what happens on a beach with seaweed. And you're doing it with this beautiful blending of warm and cool colors even in the, in the front of your painting to kind of get the sense of sand and... I, I think what you did was, was brilliant. That, that warm in the foreground just brings everything forward in the foreground. It gives you that middle ground that is greatly simplified and yet interesting. So your viewer comes in and, and goes up to that horizon and into the sky. And, and I know that once your figures are, are more prominent, once you put them in, find the right values for those, It'll just, uh, it'll just sing. You'll go right to those figures, then back down to that rock again. Right. And wonderfully done. Right. And you can see that I, you can't see my test strip in the film, but I use a test strip that that's what I'm doing when I'm, I'm testing that little bit of paint there. Um, at Before I'm doing the figures, I want to make sure the colors are working and that those figures are going to stand out but not overtake the painting. And I see that you have a sailboat, Howard, that also, again, is sort of a point of interest. Can you say a little bit about how you, how you think about the sailboat and its composition? And well, it, within the comp, it really became a compositional element. As I was laying out the, the uh, painting, I wasn't necessarily going to put it there, but I felt that I needed to bring the viewer's eye up from the big rock up mm -hmm. to that horizon line that's on a third. It'll come across to the clouds, back down to the edge of the beach and around. I don't have figures in my painting the way you do that will attract the viewer. That's something a human wants to see, other figures. They're right. seeing another human figure someplace. Right, right. And, and any kind of man-made or person-made object, like a boat, is going to draw the eye, exactly. a house, a boat. They, they, and so, you, so it needs to be accurate. It needs to work organically in the painting and not be an add-on. And your boat is so beautifully done. Oh, thank you. I, what I'm seeing you do here in just a moment ago where you brought those those uh, sort of violety grays below your figures and then you just just so simply put little shadows on the right side of the rocks indicating that that's where the light was coming from hitting across those rocks it just brought that to life and flattened out that mid mid area look how you can get your fingers in there if I did that I'd be covered in paint <laughs> exactly watercolorists do a lot more with you know scraping and and moving the paint around um, which can help blend it as well now, um, did, in your did painting. Did you do that with your rocks? Did you get in there with any kind of uh, a little. Uh, sometimes use a card or your finger? I did a bit not quite as much in this painting. I don't um, think you have to. As, yeah it depends on the on what you're trying what you're trying to achieve in the painting and but you have the option with watercolor to do some of that to create textures. Right. So I see you're getting your light on your sailboat on the sail and uh, that left side of the boat is beautiful. Well, that's, um, that just reinforces the direction of the sunlight and makes sure that we know that, that uh, that's where the light's coming from. And it's a warm white. Put some yellow in the white to keep it warm. Uh, that's just a, a way of uh, making sure that the white is pushed away. It doesn't become chalky. Right. And I think that by having the, the light on the, on the clouds and on the sail, it just you really get a sense that that light is coming in from the left and just beautifully done. Well, I remember and when I put these lights in the water, I remember that you said something about, what are those there for? 
And um, I was thinking of how they were reflect some of those clouds. Mm -hmm. um, they get covered up pretty well and because I paint in layers like everybody right. does, you know. Right. And so they do get covered up and just a hint of them come through. It's a history of the piece. Right. Remember, every mark you make is going to be there. Right. Somehow, someplace, it will be there. Right. And what I'm doing at the end of my watercolors, I'm trying to clean up areas where there might be extraneous whites that I didn't intend. So I want to leave the important whites coming through and the extraneous, I want to make sure I address those because they will distract the eye. So that's what I'm doing here. So very purposefully done. And it's that, very purposeful. And that makes that, that's what makes it sing because those, those little bits of light look like highlights. They look like little bits of, of sunlight hitting on those different objects. Right. And I just signed my piece, so I think I clearly won the dueling demo. Well, in speed, maybe. So. But, uh, but yeah, look at this. There's a classical and beautiful oil painting there. So. Uh, we'll let the viewers decide. How about that? We'll let Jack decide. He's our cameraman. Oh, great cameraman, <laughs> too, by the way. And you can see, even after I've signed it, I'm making some changes because, you know, often you, you look back at your painting and you see some areas that you need to address. And that's okay, take your time, that's what I'm doing here. I'm going back in and doing a few darks. And Howard thing, is as well, cleaning right, up the his. The key thing you said was take your time. Mm -hmm. This is the end of the painting. This is where you really don't want to mess it up. You just want to make these little golden marks, these wonderful little bits of jewelry that you're adding to your painting. Right. They right. have to be purposeful. Exactly. Right, and by I think I, I'm adding some darks and I'm seeing that you're cleaning up the sky. You're just kind of doing those final touches so that it looks really like a finished painting done very rapidly. Um, and, you know, again, when you step back from your painting, sometimes, you know, an hour later you look at it and you might see something that you want to change, but you want to have the basic painting completed and you can do this in short order uh, by following some of the steps that, that we're going to, you know, that, that we lay out here.